one is, you know, the heaven where God is immediately present. Okay, so that was the, the view in Wesley's time, and so he understood it in terms of that traditional view. Now, he also believed there was an ultimate new creation uh, that would include everything that has ever been, and by then, everything that will ever be, and that that is all complete immediately in the full reality of God. Have I said that clearly enough? In other words, um, that, uh, that first human that strode the earth and all the critters and everything else before that and the last of us to live in this universe who now die and everything in that universe and every occasion that has occurred will all be brought into the reality of God and will be complete. Okay, so that's the, the new creation and the new earth. Have I said that plain enough? There are alternative views to that, but for right now, let's stay with that one. Okay, sometime if you want to, we'll do a class on different views of God in contemporary theological thought. Okay, uh, that might be fun some of these times. Uh, yes, please. Then you were talking about something being sucked up into the third heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I was, uh, I was, I was talking. <laughs> I was, I was kind of talking about the way I see things. Uh, sucked may not quite be the word, but, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, I, I usually use the word ascends, uh, but you also get the imagery going in both directions. In Revelation, you know, the new heaven and the earth come down, uh, a new heaven and new earth come down to this world. But when you're talking about the world as we now understand it, which direction is up and what does come down mean? Unless it means some kind of an encompassing reality of God that, in, that, that takes in everything and makes it complete. Uh, is that, am I saying that clearly? Any comments or questions before we move? Hmm. I know you're lying. I know you're saying, what, <laughs> what in the world is he talking about? Yes. Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, well, sorry about that. And I, I hit it first try, and then I got mad at myself for not knowing it, you know. But um, I'll tell you what, why don't you, where would you go to look? You looked at, you looked up a traditional three heavens, traditional three heavens. Why don't you look up, uh, I tried two things. One, I forget what I looked up, but I hit it right, immediately. But and it's very important when you do the web to know what you're looking at. Because you can really run into some woo -woo 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 stuff there. But uh, uh, try Wesley and the three heavens or try just the traditional three heavens. I think that's what I tried. And I got what I mentioned. Okay. Other question, comment? Uh, I'm almost surprised any of you are here today after I sent that outline this week. <laughs> I said, oh, dear God, they ain't going to come. <laughs> But uh, all right, uh, I've, I, uh, my problem is that when I start doing that stuff, I, uh, I, I can't quit. So it winds up being a lot longer than you need at this stage of the game and more than I can do tonight. I mean, it didn't take us all four sessions even to do that outline tonight. But I have highlighted the key things that I, I want you to know so that you get some idea of the world Wesley was in and how he read scripture in that world and then the world that we're in and how we read scripture in our own time, okay? Now, please, I'm going to talk about some philosophical changes that have taken place, one of them that deeply influenced Wesley, okay? Um, but I'm also going to move beyond that to some very contemporary stuff and uh, say a word or two about that. I'll try not to kill you with it. Will you please tell me when I'm getting 
woo, 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 you, you know, just, and you're saying, so help me, you, you really can, can help me. Okay, I want to talk about the, the Enlightenment first. If you know even a little bit of history or, say, church history, you know the, the, um, the Reformation occurred in the 16th century, basically the 1500s. Luther, as you may know, was born in 1483. So he was 17 at the beginning of the, of the 16th century. The Enlightenment begins in the 17th and 18th century, okay? And uh, that was a very powerful uh, historical occasion, okay? And I want to look at it primarily in terms of enlightenment. L-I. This is an H here, folks. I can't spell it a chalkboard. I was such a stickler for spelling on student papers, and they'd laugh at me the way I spelled it a chalkboard. And, and light, that's right, isn't it? Um, anyhow, the Enlightenment, this is a time where they turn from metaphysics. Now, metaphysics would be trying to understand what is ultimately are finally real. Often that means what is that reality behind what we experience that is really true, okay? And what happened in the Enlightenment was they turned from a look at metaphysics in terms of how do we know what's real to what's called epistemology, which means how do we know at all, okay? Now we're gonna look at a couple of people that were important in Wesley's time, one of whom he rejected, and one he critically appropriated, okay? Descartes, I remember the first time I ever read that name, I called him Descartes, okay? But Descartes, French, born 1596, at the very end of the 16th century, and then he died, he didn't live long, he died in 16, 50. Now, Descartes wanted to know what could be known without doubt. So what he tried to do is to doubt everything. To doubt everything. And what he claimed was he could doubt everything except one thing. He could not doubt that there was a doubter doing the doubting. Okay, so now you may say, well, that's abstract. What does that got to do with us? That may be the single most important philosophical influence on America today. Our American individualism, which I hope you'll become critical of in some ways at least, our American individualism flows very much out of that as a prime, prime source. You see, if I can doubt everything except that I'm a doubter doubting. I can doubt you and you and you and you and you. I can doubt the world. I can doubt everything except the doubter. What then becomes important? Free autonomous self. The free autonomous self. And uh, how do we know then? Descartes said, well, you, you know by intuition. There are things in you you know, and if you develop the intuition, you can have knowledge of that. He went on, we don't need to go there tonight because that's not where Wesley went. Wesley rejected Descartes, but he went with Locke. Now this is so important. When we talk about the, um, when we talk about Wesley's notion of sanctification, this notion of Locke's and experience is just utterly central to his work. Okay, I'll, I'll say more about that as we go. Locke is, Locke is born 1632 in the 17th century, and he dies three years after Wesley's born. All right, And he's, I dare say, the most significant philosopher in Wesley's time and for Wesley. Now, let me give you a very short sentence about what Locke thinks. There is nothing in the mind that is not first 
in your experience. Hear it? And he believed that the mind is a, he called it a tabula rasa, a blank slate. So we got a mind that's a blank slate and experience writes on the mind, makes marks on the mind. You got the picture? Now, Locke, Locke had real questions about what we could finally know. And then maybe we can't really finally know anything. And if you ask me, that's what I believe. But I've got some Christian notions that mess with that. <laughs> Part of the reason for that is because of what the way Wesley used Locke. Wesley understood that, wait a minute, I hear your point about human experience cannot finally know anything, but God believed Wesley can reveal self to us. Hear it? In other words, God can make self known to us apart from whatever our human powers are. Am I saying that plainly enough? So Locke is very important. Locke does have a strong individualism, <laughs> and it certainly influenced Wesley. <laughs> In fact, sometimes I like to say it infected him. <laughs> but I think if you're going to be an individualist, Wesley's about as good a one as you can be. As you can be. Um, I remember Wesley, he lived almost the entirety of the 18th century, 1703, 1791. That's still in the Enlightenment. All right. And some really big stuff happened in that enlightenment world. Now, remember one other thing here too. In that enlightenment world, um, where, was that? where was that? Oh, yeah. Think about what happened in the, in the 18th century. Did you know that Adam Smith wrote Wealth of Nations? Well, published it in 1776. Hmm. You think about the influence that document, that book, has had on the West and on America. You know, the whole free enterprise, uh, uh, the, the fundamentals of the market, how the market shapes uh, the common good, let the market work, and the, and the greatest good of the greatest number will occur from it. Now, there are all kinds of reasons to be critical of that. But I'm just saying, think about how important that was. The only thing is it occurred a little late for Wesley. But nevertheless, he would have been, uh, I'm sorry, I'm pointing to Locke. He would have been aware of Smith. Okay. And uh, Wesley was a Tory, T-O-R-Y, which means he believed in royalty. He believed in the kings and queens of England and supported that. And he believed that the basic purpose of government was to protect you from wrong, not to promote positive avenues of action in behalf of the population. He believed that, and yet he did all kinds of things that don't fit, <laughs> like his opposition to slavery, his support of women, his uh, commitment to the poor, da, 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 da. I mean, just... Hospitals. Pardon? Hospitals. Hospitals, yeah. Schools. He even wrote his own medical book. <laughs> I tell you, I've got enough aches and pains nowadays. I'm, I'm thinking about just getting a bunch of y'all together that are over 80 and asking you a question. What are the things you know to do when you hurt? <laughs> All right. So uh, this is a very important time. Now, notice a couple of things here. We've talked about how important experience is for Locke and also for Wesley, somewhat qualified and challenged. All right. Are we on board there? Now, let's look at the spiritual senses. Remember, this, this profound orientation toward experience is going to affect Wesley's thought about faithful life. All right. And he believed that we have spiritual senses that have to be formed. That is, 
A lot of people use this fancy word. I love the word sensorium. What is that? That's an organization of your senses. It's a structuring of the senses. It, it influences the way you see, hear, taste, touch, smell. Okay. Peggy uh, did art for, Lord, honey, how long? 40 years, 50 years? She did hundreds of paintings. One of the things that I loved to do was to be in a room. Now, I, I didn't say a word. But I'd love to be in a room when there'd be eight or ten artists and they'd start talking about a scene. And I'd sit there and just listen for what they would see. You wouldn't believe what those people could see. They could see things I could not, could not perceive. You know, you know what I'm saying? What is that? It's a trained eye. Huh? A good, a good shelf. I, I hear, can smell when food is done. I cannot. I burn it. <laughs> yeah. I was talking to a guy named John Flowers, former student of mine. I love him to death. And all we do is a white form of the, of the dozens on each other. That is, we insult each other continually. If people are around us at one of these things, they think we're about to get in a fight. You know, that's crazy. But anyhow, I love the guy. He had a ministry with homeless folk in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, one day I was trying to work on smell. I, I can understand how you form sight, hearing. You know, you know I played a trumpet. I, I can hear, you know, instruments and so forth in an orchestra, a band, a symphony, whatever. But I, I got to that question. How would you use smell in ministry? Huh? So I call flowers. And I said, John, I told him what I was working on. I said, have you got any kind of an example of how your smell has become formed in ministry? You know what he said? Of course. I wanted to hit him. You know, of course. I'm, work I'm working on this for days. He's already got it. He says, when I work with homeless people, if a homeless person is fairly hygienic, that usually means they're pretty functional. If they're not very hygienic, that usually means they're not very functional. So I already get an idea of how I've got to respond and do what those folks need. Hmm? Sharp, huh? John has a sensorium huh? where his smell is highly developed in that sense. You understand what I'm saying? Now, Wesley would want to talk about the ways in which in sanctification, remember now, this is growing in grace, this is becoming holy. This is moving into the restoration of the image of God that is in us and all that. Remember that? So here's, here's a case in which Wesley wants to talk about how we form our sensorium. Do you see how it comes right out of Locke? Huh? Experience, tabula rasa, and how we take that tabula rasa and shape and form it so that we get a, sens a sensorium of spiritual makeup and senses. Am I, am I saying that plain enough? Yeah, please. Hey, I was wondering, did you talk on that uh, faith as access to, to the unseen talk. And, uh, in relation to sense-based method? So it's depicted as a sense-based method. Talk, say it again. Talk about what now? I faith couldn't. as access to the unseen. Oh, oh yes. Yes. In relation to sense-based Absolutely. Yeah. You see, for Wesley... Remember now, for Wesley, faith initially, initially is that we receive the gift of, of, of pardon from God. We've got God's prevenient grace coming at us always. And in justification, in Wesley, we receive the gift of pardon. And then when we respond to that, and we have to respond to it with Wesley, if we don't, it doesn't work. It may work on us, but it won't work with us. <laughs> I mean, we reject it. But in sanctification, as you are faithful, let me put it this way. Let, let me apply it to our course if I can. When you're faithful uh, and you read scripture, then you want the spirit to work with you in the reading of the scripture. And you see what you're doing is you're inviting in the experience of the spirit 
you're inviting the spirit in. And Wesley says, when you invite the spirit in, the spirit comes. And when you invite that spirit in, you are forming your own reps receptivity, your capacity to accept the gift of the spirit. And you can grow in your capacity to read the text in relationship to the spirit. Does that make sense? Push me where it push me where that doesn't deal with what you're talking about. Don't let me get away with a quick shot. The sense based sense based method. Okay, so is that in the reading of the scripture? Mm -hmm. And you see, reading scripture is a means of grace. Grace comes through the reading of the scripture. In other words, that's one of the ways we receive God's grace. Let me put it another way. Suppose I say, okay, God. You forgive me. You pardon me. That's it. Fine. I ain't going to read the Bible. I ain't going to pray. I ain't going to go to worship. I ain't going to go to text samples, uh, Wesley class. I just ain't going to do any of that stuff. What's Wesley going to say? Gonna You're going to have a blank tablet. Hear it? You're going to have a blank tablet. And those receptions form and shape us. Okay? Um can you stand a baseball analogy? <laughs> I love baseball. Uh, I love baseball. Uh, maybe I told y'all. Did I tell y'all the story about our dog who tripped me? Wasn't that in here? No. Our son, Sean, was having a birthday when we were living in Phoenix. We had a grill out on the back stoop uh, pad thing. And so we had some... Uh, we had some hamburgers and some steak and some, I don't know, a whole bunch of meat. And it was on this big tray, you know, like this. And we got a dog named Sugar. Maybe the sweetest dog that ever lived. The thing about Sugar, though, is she would rather have negative attention than no attention whatsoever. So when I go out the back door of this platter of stuff, I close the door so she can't go with me. So she lies down. She knows I'm coming right back the same way I went out. She lies down across the path. When I burn that meat, I come back in, push the door open, and I can't see her lying on the floor. And you know when your weight tips forward and this toe catches something? Huh? I fell, so help me God, flat. I broke my fall a little bit. There was a corner over here, and I caught it with the elbow. Bruised from here to here. I caught it a little bit. That kind of broke my fall. And I put that, that, that big pan out like this, and I fell flat and held the pan. <laughs> held the pan. So Peggy rushes over to me. She says, are you all right? The woman thinks I'm not bulletproof. Okay? <laughs> so I, I, I go to the kitchen sink, and I put the pan down on the sink. And uh, she says, are you all right? I said, I'm fine. I, I just fell down. Yeah, but you fell flat. I said, I'm fine. She said, but you're looking funny. I said, I'm thinking. <laughs> she said, what are you thinking about? I'm, I'm thinking about why I didn't drop the meat. She says, you're in shock. Okay. I said, no, I'm not. She said, well, what are you thinking about? I said, I'm thinking about catching. Catching. Like in baseball? Yeah, like in baseball. What else? You know. Well, what are you thinking? I said, well... When I was in college, we only played two games a week. So I'd pitch the first game, and then I didn't get to play the next game. See? But if I started catching, our catcher left the school. If I started catching, then I could catch the second game. So I pitched and caught all, all the way through the last couple of years of college. Now, one of the basic things about catching, uh, the thing that you have to train your sensorium in, okay, when you get run over by a 200 pound guy who can run and you're there catching a ball and he hits you just as you catch it, it's catch. And I mean, I've been knocked from here to that, well, far than that, here to that wall, okay? But notice what they do. They train your sensorium. The way you do that is you, you stand here, somebody out there throws you a soft toss. Why a soft toss? Because it's harder to catch a soft toss than a harder one. And secondly, the catcher's mitt is unwieldy, and it's made to catch hard throws, not soft ones. The point of that is you got to watch that ball all the way into the mitt. 
All right. Now, what they do is somebody over here, when they toss you the ball, they time it so that the instant you catch the ball, see, they don't want any slack. They hit you with a big pillow and they hit you hard. I mean, it's like catch, boom, catch, boom, catch, boom. You do that enough and you develop a sensorium where when you get hit, you grip the ball rather than release the ball. Got the picture? Wesley operates on that kind of notion. Growing in grace is training. Why on earth would he have people in all these small groups? Why on earth would he have you meditating when you read the biblical text? Why on earth would he have you reading the biblical text, a chapter a piece at least once a day and maybe twice a day? What is he doing? He is, what's he doing? He's constructing a sensorium. All right. An openness, an openness. Did that quit? An openness? Oh, you lost your voice. Huh? Oh, you lost your voice. Wow, wow, wow. It's on three. That's Babe Ruth's number. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> what did you do? You had muted. Okay, so look, you pushed it, the button, and it turned red. So you're muted, and you just push it again. Green, good to go. My shoulder hurts. Could you heal it? Uh, all right. So you develop this sensorium. Why? Because the danger is always with the Methodist atrophy. Okay, hang on. Oh, come in. <laughs> oh, you turned it all the way off. Oh, I'm not made for that world. I don't know. I think you had to catch your 40 years ago. You learned to grip it. I learned to, you do learn to grip. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I have really been run. Let me tell you, though, one time this guy, he's he's young and he hadn't played a lot. He's going to run over me. <laughs> when I caught that ball, I moved this way, but I left my hip here. I put him 20 feet into a screen. It was just absolutely delicious. <laughs> If, if he hit me today, it would kill me. <laughs> uh, so, but what happens is the senses can atrophy. And that's why we are Methodists. Okay? We got a method of growing in grace. We've got methods of receiving the gift of God in Christ and receiving the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You, you got the picture? In that sense, this tabula rasa in Locke huh, is being filled up in Wesley by these gifts of the Spirit. Hmm? So we become attuned to God. You remember what salvation is in Wesley? Attuned to God is restoring the image of God within us. And basic to that restoration, it's not the only thing. There are lots of things, but basic to that restoration is indeed the, uh, the development of the senses, the spiritual senses, formation of, transformation of. Uh, another one, and I'm, 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 I'm trying, thank you, dear. I'm trying to use something that's... Uh, I, I, The first book I ever read all the way through, I was in the fifth grade. And I remember distinctly what I said to myself. I hope I never have to do that again. <laughs> you know? Now, you ask her, if I sit down, if I do, if I get up at four or five in the morning, whatever I do, I'm going to pick up a book. My point is, I was not born that way. That got formed in me. Now, I'm writing right now, but when I'm not writing, I read 40 hours at least a week. And the thing is, it ain't work. It ain't work. It's just, God, that is so good. <laughs> Do you understand? Did I do that? No, that's just formation. That's formation. Hmm? And you've got, this room is full of people who've been formed. And all, 
Tell me, tell me where you've been formed. Anybody? Two or three of you. How have you been formed? Piano lessons. Piano lessons. Oh, wow. Artist. Artist. Yeah. How else? Come on, let's get some down on the ground stuff that. Basketball. Basketball. Mm -hmm. Music. Music. Anybody uh, learn to iron a shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you talk about atrophy, huh? You know. Uh, it may not be right. But. Yeah, <laughs> it may not be right. Yeah, yeah. You'll notice if you watch close, you'll notice I don't, I don't iron my shirts. <laughs> I'm not good at it. But, but by growing in grace, we become attuned to God. All right. Now, let me say two things. Do you see? How Wesley has rejected Descartes. By the way, Descartes, there was a wonderful philosopher. He's my favorite philosopher named Wittgenstein. And he says this about Descartes. If Descartes had doubted everything, he could not doubt at all. And that just leveled the Cartesian argument. Okay. So I don't know anybody anymore who buys this stuff. And yet culturally... We assume it all the time. Hmm? Hmm? Now, let's come over here. That was the Enlightenment. Basically, 17th, 18th, yeah, maybe 19th century. You get into some other periods, the Romantic period. You get into the, the, uh, oh, the Victorian period and so forth. But modernity. Watch what happens here especially with us, Locke and later Hume, the empiricists uh, on the one hand, and that kind of individualism coming out of a Descartes, that is very powerful in, in, the, uh, in the modern period. That's basically the last, I don't know that you can count the 20th century, not altogether in that, because we get post-modernity. But nevertheless, modernity has a powerful individualism in it. How many of you went to church or revivals or something like that and somebody talked almost exclusively about you being saved, giving your heart to Jesus? Hmm? Uh, how many of you heard very much about the whole role of the church. Usually the church and those situations where we need to get all of us who's accepted Jesus together and get more people to accept Jesus. And I heard, I grew up hearing an individualistic interpretation of the gospel. And it took me 20 years to get over it. I'm talking about reading, study. Um, but that was very powerful. How many people look at politics, economics, social life, culture, in terms of this individualism? It's still there. Um, that doesn't mean that persons are not important. Don't take that the wrong way. I'm not talking about persons being unimportant, okay? Uh, they desperately, intrinsically are in the Christian faith. Also, this view over here, they tended, by the time it got into the modern period, they believed in universal reason. That means once you can reason, that kind of reason will stand up anywhere in the world. And you know what we began to discover? That uh, people in different parts of the world use reason very differently. Where is this universal reason? Or let me say it another way. You got people who say, wait a minute. <clears throat> um, we've got people that use reason differently at different times in history. Descartes used reason differently 
than Locke. And Wesley, different than modifying him, but quite different than him. Where is this reason that applies in all times and places? And what I think you can say, the view is that it, it ain't there. In fact, not only reason, they would argue that we are so historically conditioned, okay, that the times in which we live shape us as profoundly, maybe more profoundly than anything else. You go and look at the tradition of the church and read church history, and you will find how reason is used quite differently across the history of the church. You understand what I'm saying? So that we get we get real, we get not only a historical reason, but we really get the fact that we are so historically conditioned in every part of our life. Now, the question I'm going to ask you in a minute is, how then do you make theological claims? How do you read Scripture? And don't die on me because I love this stuff, and I think there's a way to do it. Look at science. You know, when I was growing up, science was thought to discover real truth. Hmm? Real truth. And I don't mean to... to demean science. It's just in the same spot we're all in. All right. uh, a guy named Thomas Kuhn, K-U-H-N, wrote a book in the 60s, 69, and he made the argument that I think has stuck. There's been criticism of his view, but I think it's basically stuck. Science is based on paradigms. And paradigms shift. One of the things I love to do is when we study uh, Genesis uh, 1 and we look at uh, Genesis 1 came from a Babylonian myth called the Enuma Elish. And the way the Babylonians understood creation was this god Marduk takes this woman Tiamat and he splits her from here all the way down and then spreads her. And that's how he pushes back the watery chaos and the earth then is created in the space from the blowing out of her body. You got the picture? That's the best science there was in the world at that time. Hmm? Now, please, I'm not equating today's science with that. And I deeply respect the discipline of science. That's not the point. But I'm trying to say to you that philosophically, science, too, is historically conditioned. What will science, I, when I think back, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm talking to you about just 2,000 years ago in science with Tiamat and Marduk. That's just 2,000 years. That's a blip. What is science going to look like in 2,000 years? The only thing I stink and hate about dying right now is I'm not going to see what happens in the next 100 years. You know, I, I, I've lived 88. I've been conscious of what's going on for about 70 of those years, you know. Golly, I'd love to see what's going to happen. Maybe we got a peephole, you know. But you hear the point? Things need to change. In this view in modernity, social life was voluntary. Uh, our constitution is based in it. It's based in that kind of philosophical thought. Does that dismiss all of our constitution? Of course not. But think about it. People... People come together to form a state. Hmm? It's a voluntary act by free individuals. If you know that history, if you've studied the groups that people were in, you know that's crazy. They didn't come together as free individuals. Look at the development of the East Coast of the United States and the way the population moved across the country. Look at what's going on in the 1760s, 1770s, and 1780s when this country is created. You think we're free voluntary institution? <laughs> Listen, the pressure that the Southern senators put on the, the making of the Constitution in order to guarantee slavery was enormous. 
To miss that is to play with fabrications. And I don't mean to be disrespectful. God, I love this country. You know what I'm saying? I love this country. But let's let's be serious. Listen, <laughs> you are you are what's the word? I can't think of but one. You are imp your impregnation was a social event. If you are not held when you are born, you freaking die. Huh? You are learning language, maybe even inside the womb, but at least you're probably learning some rhythms and stuff going on around in that outside world in the womb. Huh? When you begin to learn language, oh God, we don't develop memory, they say, until we're about three. Huh? And then think about how you got formed. Huh? Where'd you grow up? What stories shaped you? Do you think you were some free, autonomous individual who made up stories for yourself so you didn't need the ones you heard? That's crazy. What am I saying? Folks, even the Trinity is a social reality. Why are Christians calling out to be individualistic when God is triune? Hmm? Uh, I'm, am I being nasty? I don't mean to be nasty. I, I just kind of feel this stuff a little. You know what I'm saying? All right. So, but now look at postmodernity. God, I love postmodernity and I hate it. <laughs> postmodernity says, well, if you're looking for a foundation for knowing that you can arrive at philosophically or through thought, it ain't there. It ain't there. And we've got several centuries of work on this. And we keep coming up there. I now work once a month with a group of about 10 philosophers. I swear to you, it is wonderful. And uh, they they taught philosophy all over the United States. We get together on, uh, uh, what's it called? Zoom. 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 And we... Uh, and we talk about philosophers. One of the things that is true, let me make it another, let me say it another way. One of the things that is claimed in that group by everyone in the group is there is no foundation of knowing. In fact, all knowing, they would contend, involves some kind of trust. It involves assumptions. Okay? And nobody thinks without assumptions. Hmm. What does that mean? If you've placed your faith in a philosophical point of view that promises you a, a foundation of knowing, it does not exist. They talk about an Archimedean point. Do you remember Archimedes? Archimedes was a guy who believed he could move the earth if he could get a leverage, you know, to jar it. What that has come to mean is an Archimedean point is where you can experience the world and reason about the world with such independence that you can come up with real truth. Okay, in other words, you can have a foundation for your knowing. <laughs> what they say now is there ain't no Archimedean point. Hear what they're saying? No foundation for you know. Don't you know this? Don't you know this kind of just popularly? Haven't you haven't you got it in your bones? Don't you have, well, we don't really know. That's right. So how do we read scripture? What do we do as a faith? I'm gonna tell you what I think and then ask you what you think. I would contend that knowing occurs. By the way, what I'm saying does not dim this notion of using experience to be formed and shaped. Mm -hmm. uh, I would argue that I think the knowing we do occurs in a tradition. 
All right. Some people would say a tradition understood as a form of life. It's story. It's stories. Hmm. It's people who are shaped by this form of life, by this tradition, by these stories, by this, um, by exactly those kinds of practices that shape who we are. Hmm. Why am I a Christian? I'm a Christian because I simply have never been able to deny the power of this tradition, which is primarily based in Scripture. Hmm. We make all the kind of qualifications about reading a text we want to make. But I think the tradition of the Christian church is fundamentally here. All right. And that tradition is that story, that community, that historical people who have now been going for a couple of thousand years. Uh, can I prove that? No. Um, I would like to think that I bet my life on it. Okay? I'd like to think that. Um, I haven't been in but one really violent demonstration. But I think <clears throat> when the folks started throwing the punches and the rest, I was, I was here. Does that mean uh, we use reason? We sure do. You know what Wesley said? Reason doesn't come up with truth, but it helps us uh, work with, you know, think through, figure, make sense of the kind of truth we've got. Hmm? You give me that book. Come back at me. What are you, what are you thinking? Yeah. There has to be a powerful lot of experience before that tradition becomes real. A powerful lot of experience. That's right. I, I think that's true. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and some of it wrong. <laughs> you know. But nevertheless, you got 2,000 years of community there. I love my country, but if I got to choose between this story and the story of America, I'm going to choose this story. I'm certainly going to choose this story before I choose that of the Soviet Union. As Isaiah says, the nations are a drop from the bucket. <laughs> They're dust on the scales. And yet Revelation says that the nations are also in the final parade when there's a new creation of heaven and earth. So important stuff going on. Don't throw it out. <laughs> okay. Um, comments, questions. I'm trying to say we read scripture now in these two contexts. And what I also want to say is John Wesley becomes helpful again. For one place, and I've erased it, for one place, and the whole range of practices of formation that he set before us, and the development of small groups, and the mission and the work of ministry. Um, question, comment? You don't have to question, you can rake your own speech. I don't even know what you mean by foundation there. You don't know what what? In the anti-foundation. What do you consider the foundation? Yeah. The foundation is it is it uh, an internal set of uh, guidelines or techniques, methods, assumptions that we may or may not be aware of. I'm saying a foundation would be an empirically and reasonable uh, establishment of the truth. Well, 
when you said some things there that don't, don't jive with real humans to me. Yeah, like, well, please push that. Yeah, go. Yeah. I have to think on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I want you to do is push, push that. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody else have thoughts on the foundation, how they come to make the decisions they make? Well, everybody has a different perspective yes. of reality for themselves. Yeah. And each of us has our own. Hear it? That's the postmodern mind. Now, that took an individualistic turn, but that's the postmodern view. Hmm? I'm, not, I'm not talking bad about you. I'm just <laughs> using the illustration. Okay. Um, do, do you hear what I'm saying? How many of you say to somebody, well, whatever you think is important? Well, wives do that all the time. Wives do it all the time? <laughs> okay. All right. But I like at work, I try, I try, I guess myself saying, well, this is the way we, we've always done it. Uh huh. Now, that's a tradition. Hey. Now remember this about tradition, though, because I love this from Alistair McIntyre, who's a Roman Catholic and a wonderful philosopher. He says tradition is a socially embodied, it's a group, historically extended across time argument. <laughs> tradition is an argument. We're always going to have the argument. Some of the criticism of him that I love is, yeah, and it's also when people come together and have consensus. So you can't just reduce it to argument. Here, get the point. I mean, even with the differences in this church, we seem to have some things we agree on, don't we? Are we utterly at each other's throats? And see, to me, that's where that scripture becomes so important. Because I believe it's infallible? No. No. We've talked, Wesley didn't believe that. No, because I believe God spoke to people who wrote that word and that the Spirit continues to work with that word and work in our very lives. Hmm. Oh, please. Yeah. I got a question. Do you elaborate more on, on number nine? You said focus on a concrete lived life. Uh huh. Yeah. Concrete, <clears throat> concrete live. There are a lot of ways to talk about it. Let me just talk about one. If that doesn't satisfy you, holler and we'll talk about another. What I'm trying to, to do there is to get away from living abstractions. Um, I'm, I'm going to pick some really nasty examples. All right. You ever know somebody who said something like this? Uh, my life's going to be all right. I'm going to be fine. And things are just going wonderfully well. And you know for a fact she's being beaten once a week. Her abstractions are not where her concrete lived life is. And what we want to do is, what I want to do is, I want the gospel to speak to the concrete lived lives of people, not the fabrications we construct, we construct with abstractions. You know what I mean? More of a reality of life. It's, yeah, it, down on the ground, real stuff. It usually takes up resonance in practices. Okay. What are the practices of your life? I can say, uh, I can say, oh, I just love Jesus all the time. What are my practices? <laughs> hey, what's down on the ground, the stuff I'm doing? All right. Uh, does that help? Is that getting at it? Yeah. Did you have a little bit of another nuance there you were thinking about? Well, I just wanted a more uh, concrete. Yeah. You, you, know, you listed about morality, diversity, other things. <clears throat> uh, and so I just kind of mm -hmm. where you were going with that. So. Yeah. 
Remember practices. That's a biggie. Let me, let me do one other thing with Wesley that I just love. It's really good in Wesley. Wesley has the notion, two notions really. Uh, one is affections. And affections in his thought basically takes on the character of the will. You know, um, let me try to see if I can put it this way. Uh, what do you have the will to do almost any time you decide to? Eat. Huh? Eat. 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 I dare say that's right. You've got a powerful affection there, you know, and, and uh, it, your affections are where you really don't have to make yourself do it. You know, I don't have to make myself read. Now, I sometimes have to make myself read a particular book because I don't agree with it. You know, I make a point of reading books I don't agree with. But the, the point is, uh, that's just so formed in me. Good or bad, indifferent. You know, it's formed in me. Um, didn't I tell you all the story? Uh, when you Another thing, when you catch... I can't get down on my knee. <laughs> when you, oh, I might not get up, and that knee might just go. Uh, when you catch, if a ball is down, you know, like the pitcher's throwing a ball and it's going to hit in the ground out there, I can't get my knee down. The first thing, you, you go down. You go down with your glove, and you make a bowl with your body. Okay? Now, my butt would be lower, but you, you, you see what I'm saying? So you make a bowl. Why do you go down? You go down because you can come up so much faster. You can come up so much faster than you can go down when the ball hits the ground. You, you understand what I'm saying? You can come up. Right? So, and I, I'm not bragging here. I'm talking about what training does. We're talking about, I, I want to use this for growing in grace. I was sitting at a table not long ago, and I had on a jacket, which I hate. And uh, I pulled my hand back. And the, those little buttons on your jacket caught the knife and pulled it off the table. You know, so I reached back and, the, and I caught it before it hit the floor. Now, I'm not, I wasn't born with that. Do you understand? It's just that I had been trained for years to go down. And I was able to catch the thing before it hit the floor. That's, that's training. And Wesley, you might say that's, that's kind of an affection, okay? But notice he also had the word tempers. Tempers is a kind of a habituated uh, set of practices or whatever. I guess what I'm really talking about here when I was talking about catching the knife, I'm talking about the development of a temper. Love and ball is my affection being trained in that temper. You see what I'm saying? And, and uh, so it's habituated practices. Uh, how many of you, when you had first, first had children, knew al almost nothing about raising a child? Anybody in here? Uh, um, how many of you learned to recognize differences in the way the baby cries? Hmm? How many of you could tell when the baby was just fussing and when the baby needed something or the baby was wet? Hmm? Could you begin to hear that? In Wesley's language, we may love that baby, but we develop tempers because we got to have some habituated practices to know how to take care of one. Here? So that what I'm trying to say about Scripture in addition to what we've also already said, is that we have this will of affection. And Wesley wants us to develop these tempers of reading the text that form and shape who we are. Am I that communicate? Comment or question? Scripture is foundation, right? Talking about foundation. We're talking about foundation. You're, I think you, well, I hear you talking about foundation in a different way. 
the foundation I've been criticizing is one that believes that through human knowing, we can establish a firm place to know the truth. I'm saying I don't think that exists. What I think you might be seeing here is that we engage in practices that, that provide a foundation for our lives, for our practices. Hear the difference? Um, one of the great things about Jesus is I just, I just love this about Jesus. I, I, I have all kinds of trouble doing it. I, I, I give you that. Jesus taught to love your enemies. Hmm? How do you, <laughs> how do you develop those kind of tempers and build those into your affections? Huh? Wesley would say, uh, it's easy. Get in the habit of liking, lo not liking, loving people you don't regard as your friend. <laughs> God, think about somebody you really don't like. Huh? And, uh, and start loving them. Jesus thinks the kingdom is made of that. Okay. Oh my God, you're, you're supposed to tell me when the time is up. You're no wonder you're being nice. You're sitting there not telling me. Uh, hey, it has been a delight to uh, be with you folks. I appreciate you showing up. And oh, okay. okay. And uh, 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 I love this stuff. I hope you will continue to love it and find all kinds of ways in which your tempers will grow in uh, grace and uh, and holiness. There's a there's a an image of God and everybody in here. Where are the cliff notes for this? Cliff notes. You know, I've got I've got the outline. I've got a whole outline of of Maddox's book, yeah. but it's about I think it's forty pages long. I don't think you'd want it. <laughs> uh, but that's the way I read. If somebody wants it, let me know. I can probably send it to you. That's the only way I can understand a book. Uh, I'm not real smart. I have to have outlines. Does anybody else have that? You learn that too by, by practicing. So go in peace and may the God of peace go with you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>